Mount Kilimanjaro, an icon of Africa, and for centuries a mystic destination for adventurers and explorers. In this series, CCTV Africa will attempt to take you to the top of this beautiful and dangerous mountain. And look at what makes it such a draw to so many people around the world each year. Kilimanjaro is many things to many people. It's a fragile ecosystem, and it's also a place of work for the thousands of people who live on its slopes. It's a journey of stamina fraught with hazards and extreme conditions at every turn. <laughs> Good job. Somewhere out there, there's Mount Kilimanjaro waiting for us to get on it. We can't see anything right now. It's cold, it's wet, it's windy. Running through a lot of trees, can't see Mount Kilimanjaro right now. Um, this is pretty intimidating. It's just taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time, it's exciting. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. And that's usually the best part. Mount Kilimanjaro is the tallest mountain on the African continent and the world's tallest freestanding mountain. Sometimes called the Roof of Africa, it's a huge, dormant volcano rising nearly six kilometers above sea level. During our climb, our guide would lead us through five climatic zones. We'll pass from lush mountain forests into scenic moorland. We'll then move into the stark alpine desert zone. From there, we'll climb up into the Arctic region, where we will get the chance to see Kilimanjaro's famous vanishing glaciers. Our climb will culminate in a difficult last push up to Huru Peak at the summit. It's a long and challenging journey, passing through some unique environments with a chance to see some of Africa's most awe-inspiring scenery. However, many people who attempt this climb don't actually make it to the top. Tragically, some even die each year in the attempt. One of the things that we're going to be looking at on our journey is just how much the mountain and the process of climbing it has changed over time. To find out, I paid a visit to the home of the Kilimanjaro Mountain Club at the Marango Hotel. Seamus Bryce Bennett is the current owner of the hotel and custodian of the Mountain Club's records. On the afternoon of Thursday, July the 26th, 1928. When explorers in the 1840s first described seeing a snow-capped mountain on the equator, people did not believe them. Many attempts were made to be the first to reach the top, but it was a long time later, in 1889, before the mountain was finally conquered by a team led by German geographer Hans Meyer. So, Rama, we got some interesting photos in here. This is a collection of photos. Yeah. It shows how the ice has changed on Kibo over a period of over a century. Yeah. Because that's the first is 1920. Yeah, this is 1920. And just look at it. There's an ice cap all the way around. This here is 2005. And, it, you know, it, it's really, it, it's uh, a fraction of what it was up there. I've never done this before. What would you tell someone like me to watch out for? What are the do's and don'ts when climbing out on Mount Kilimanjaro? Ultimately, it comes down to four cardinal rules if you want to have a successful climb of the mountain. Number one, the most important, go slowly. Pole pole, all right? Because yeah, you're altitude. Telling, you're, you're telling that to a Kenyan. We're not really used to going slowly. You have to. <laughs> altitude is no respecter mm. of youth, strength, fitness, or Kenyans. Mm. All right? <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> right. Number two, you've got to drink like it's going out of fashion. You Lots just have water. to really pour the fluids into you. Mm. And thirdly, when you're up high, you've really got to watch the sun. 
You know, it's, it is just uh, hugely dangerous. The ultraviolet burns people to a crisp. And finally, I always say to people, look, we can never guarantee you're going to get to the top of the mountain. Sometimes altitude is kind and sometimes it's not. So ultimately, you've got to remember, it's a beautiful, unique mountain. And wherever you get to on it, you just have to enjoy yourself. And you have to respect the mountain. Oh, of course, you respect it but ultimately enjoy it. But on the way to begin our climb, things weren't exactly off to an enjoyable start. Right, so we haven't even gotten to our first starting point for the trek yet, but this should give you an idea of the sort of challenges we have to deal with. The roads up here are so bad, the bus carrying our luggage is actually now having a problem getting through the mud. Where we're standing now, this isn't particularly bad, but as you go up the road, it gets a lot, lot worse. You've got ditches on either side of the road and some really, really soft mud, very sticky, very nasty to drive through. So up here, it gets a lot worse. Deep ruts on either side of the road, very, very narrow, and that isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Right then, uh, the mountain's first challenge, uh, having the bus stuck somewhere down the road, has finally been overcome. Our gears all here, doing final checks, everything seems to be in order. But night is going to fall fairly soon. Temperatures will drop, the rain might actually come. The weather around here snaps very quickly. So torches, very handy. Rain gear, in my case a poncho, also very handy. It's one thing to talk about climbing the mountain. It's another thing to actually do it. This is a part where actually the rubber meets the road, so let's go climb Mount Kilimanjaro, shall we? After much preparation, we are finally on the trail that will hopefully take us to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. The first day and a half of our journey will be through this lush, thick mountain forest. It may be one of the wettest parts of the mountain, but it contains an amazing variety of unique plants and animals. It's an otherworldly environment filled with ferns and mosses and enormous trees draped in bearded lichens. In the 19th century, Kilimanjaro was a key destination for botanists and plant collectors from all over the world. Several species, such as the impatiens Kilimanjari, cannot be found anywhere else on Earth. Leading our climb will be our guide, Simon Tui. Born on the mountain slopes, he's right at home here and he knows almost every inch of this mountain. He also happens to be a former world record holder for the fastest unsupported ascent of Kilimanjaro. This mountain I means so much to me. Uh, it's a mountain that I've seen it, I've playing around it, I've climbed it. I've seen people from all different backgrounds come and climb the mountain. So I'm just sort of very inspired to be uh, one of the child to be playing around as my playground. The question will come quite often, um, do I feel tired of seeing the same things? Obviously that's not the case. This is the mountain every time you can see in a different face. And every time I will have a different story to tell. As the day draws to an end, the team are still on the trail. The density of the forest and the humidity have a sapping effect on energy and morale. I, for one, am getting tired and our camp is still a way ahead. This is day one. We finished a two-ish hour trek. 
from where we started through some beautiful, absolutely beautiful forest. Um, steep hills though, my ankles are practically numb. Um, feels like there's a whole bunch of ants that decided to crawl up my thighs and just, you know, nibble on them. But by morning that should all be gone. In terms of expectations versus what actually I experienced, this is interesting. Um, this is totally new for me. I've never gone camping before, um, never done any extended trail hiking on this scale before. And it's been fun. It's more of a mental thing um, than an actual physical problem. If you put your mind to it and you can actually execute it and you believe you can and you push yourself towards that, anything's possible. Early morning in the forest of Kilimanjaro is a magical time. As the sunlight clears the mist away, our journey up Africa's highest mountain continues. <laughs> First night ever for me under canvas was pretty interesting. I mean, you look at these tiny little tents, you don't think a lot can be done with them, but they're actually quite comfy once you sort it out. Blanket, uh, thermal blanket to that, decent mattress, nice cozy little sleeping bag, job done. You'll be out before you know it. Today's climb will be a very intense one. As a crow flies, you're going to cover about 8 to 10 kilometers, which isn't a lot, if the ground is flat. The problem is today, we're going to be gaining about 700 meters in altitude in one day. Normally, it's recommended that you do, do not do more than 300. And we're going to try and push ourselves to actually double that and exceed it quite a bit. Um, I do hope my legs are up for it, but we'll see. As we leave the forest behind, we emerge to some spectacular views of the surrounding landscape and a sudden change in weather. It's absolutely bucketing down. But the good news is, despite being wet and all the challenges that poses for shooting in this absolutely torrential rain, uh, we have more or less cleared the forest. Now we're entering the moorland, uh, stage two as far as vegetation is concerned on the mountain. But this isn't time to celebrate. The Shira Plateau is still ahead of us. We've still got a lot of ground to cover. Roughly 500 meters of elevation from where we are. And after that, and only when that's covered, can we finally get to our camp for the night. Camp is the only shelter for miles around, so we must push on. The landscape is bleak and the going extremely tough. My legs are gone. Um, my, yeah, generally that's it, exhausted. And we still have a lot more to go. Eventually, we crest the Shira Ridge and are rewarded with our first views of the Shira Plateau and hiding in the cloud, the snow-capped peak of the mountain. Our camp is also in view and a final effort gets us to shelter and rest. Oh, my 
For the next two days, we relentlessly continue our trek across Kilimanjaro, Stark Heath and Moorland. We travel through good weather and bad, with the mountaintop continuously playing hide and seek with the group. The Shira Plateau is actually the collapsed crater of the oldest of the three volcanic vents that together make up Mount Kilimanjaro. While the highest and our current objective, Kibo, is dormant, Mawenzi and Shira are no longer active. We've been walking through a boulder field for hours now, and it's, it's full of these massive rocks scattered all over the landscape, as you can see here, and they're pretty big. I mean, the sheer size of these things is amazing, 30, 40, probably 80 kilos in weight. And just imagine, we're about 10, 15 kilometers maybe from the peak of Kibo, and the force required to move something this big, or 80 kilos of this, from all the way up there to down here is enormous. But here's what's really mind-blowing. Imagine how much force is needed to move that. It's in environments like this that you start to understand how the many myths and legends of the mountain have come about. The Chaga people long believed that there were magical genies and spirits living on the mountain, and there are many tales of treasure troves hidden in Kilimanjaro's unexplored caves and valleys. I know firsthand just how hard it is to get up here, and we're not even halfway up the mountain yet. Today, though, I'm going to meet two gentlemen who between them have a century's worth of experience. One of them, in fact, was trained by the first guide to ever make it to the summit of Kibo. The former head of the Tanzanian military, retired General Marisho Serekeke and the legendary expedition guide Emmanuel Minja meet me to tell me about their many years on the mountain. You've been climbing this mountain several times for nearly 40 years. How has the mountain changed in that time? When, when I started growing up, first time, 1965, the traffic was practically zero. Very few people used to go up this mountain. Climate change has made a lot of difference on the mountain. The snow, uh, what I saw in 1955 and what we see now, there's a hell of a difference. So plenty of snow. Sometimes it used to come up to 14,000 feet. But today, the most times, the, the snow is limited to the actual top. The vegetation has changed. As human traffic increased, there were a lot of fires. So you find, uh, you find uh, once um, the vegetation is burned out. It takes years to grow back. back. So there are a lot of changes from what we saw at the beginning and now. Blanket, you Blanket, you You used to bring soldiers up here. General. Every year I used to come up with some senior uh, military officers. One group of senior officers whom I considered they were being a bit too comfortable by growing tummies. Um, and the other group was the people that reading their reports. Their reports were excellent. And these were people that you could entrust them with command. But I didn't know them personally. What I used to do at 18,000 feet, 
on the screen from Marangu uh, side. Always, always the manual first and, and then me. And then officer whom I wanted to interview on the mountain is number three. And I said, uh, uh, so and so, I said, yes, sir. There's somebody at the rear, go down and help him up. And then I used to observe the reaction. And this was very important for me to know exactly when this is a commander, this fellow is a commander of a unit. And then it comes to a crucial, difficult situation. How does he handle his men? For those who were, were building up tummies, I didn't have any, any interview with them because the mountain interviewed them. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to these legends of the mountain has made me more aware than ever of how difficult this climb can be. The team moves on and we're finally getting towards the end of the Shira Plateau. We're making progress in our mission to get to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. The vast change in landscape and vegetation means we're leaving behind the moorland and we're entering the Alpine Desert. But progress is getting much harder. Summiting the world's tallest freestanding mountain is neither quick nor easy, especially with a film crew tagging along in a mountain throwing some extremely foul weather down at us. We have just crossed 4,000 meters, which is pretty cool. Uh, let's see, actually, now it's slightly higher than that. It's 4,010. Uh, not many places higher than that. Um, Mount Meru, right next door, well, somewhere in the mist, is about 4,600. So by the time we get to Lava Tower, we'll be at that height. But the thing is, as much as this is an interesting achievement, we now just have another 2,000 to go. Go figure. Onwards then. The higher we get, the greater our chances of suffering from altitude sickness. Earlier in our climb, I got to see a special item in our equipment that could mean the difference between life and death in an emergency. One of the very real concerns and the very real risks of an expedition like this is altitude sickness. Crudely put, if you send too high, too quickly, your body just doesn't have any time to adapt to the fact that the oxygen levels become much, much thinner the higher you go. And at 5,900 meters, there's very little oxygen. The easiest and simplest way of dealing with altitude sickness is just really to get whoever's suffering from it down the mountain as fast as possible. But in case that isn't possible, that's where this then comes in. It's a gamo bag. Think of it really as a pressurized canister. Um, I could tell you what it does, but it's a lot easier for me to just actually show you. So let's assume for the sake of argument, I'm the victim here. I've got altitude sickness and our guide here, Joel, needs to take emergency measures as soon as possible. Gets me into the bag. Make sure it's all snug and tight, and then after that, he locks it up. Basically, it's a sealed chamber. What you're hearing now is oxygen being pumped, or rather air being pumped into the bag, and we therefore simulate bringing the victim down to say sea level. The rate at which this is continuing is actually going to, break, to bring me down to a level much, much lower than Moshi Tan where we started our climb. That's about 800 meters above sea level. And by the time this is done, we'll be much, much closer um, to zero. Once 
once this is inflated and it's up to pressure, it's actually quite comfortable. The pressure does build up fairly rapidly. So in an emergency, this is extraordinarily handy. My one hope, however, is that we just don't have to use this in the duration of this entire climb, because that would really, really have to be an emergency. So one demonstration done, and hopefully this is the last time we see this. Back on the trail, the cold and the rapidly changing weather makes for tough going. Before the use of tents and huts, climbers of Kilimanjaro used to spend the night in one of its many caves, which also happened to provide excellent shelter from the rain. We are now out of the heath and moorlands. We are now effectively in the Alpine desert. When you think of desert, obviously it's supposed to be hot and dry and dusty. Obviously not the case here. Uh, the crew decided to take a bit of a break from the rain and the mist and the cold. There's a lot of it up here. Uh, and of course, at the same time, when you do take a break out here, you have to refuel, very important. The saturating weather does not stop and the team doesn't either. We have to make it to Lava Tower in good time if we are to get to our camp at the base of the treacherous Western Breach by nightfall. I have to push myself. The altitude and the conditions mean my head is down and I barely notice the looming presence of Lava Tower in the mist ahead. The tower is a huge stack of cooled and hardened lava that dominates the landscape. It's a volcanic plug, effectively corking the vent that created it. It's a stunning setting for a breather, but suddenly there's bad news from our guides about our plan to go up the western breach. Impossible. It's impossible to go there. Let me explain what's going on here. Um, Tom, our producer, and of course Joel, one of our guides. Our original plan was to move from here, the Lava Tower camp, and then head up there to the Arrow Glacier, and then finally use the Western Breach. It's the most challenging way up the mountain. But the weather's been particularly bad. It's raining. We've actually come in in a bank of sleet to this particular camp. And Joel's telling us that simply isn't safe. He's recounting incidents in 2002 where a porter died. In fact, sometime in September, October, a tourist also died going up the exact same route. So, yeah, we'll have to change our plan. We crack on and leave behind the imposing wall of rock and ice. Our new route to the Barranco camp actually now takes us downhill. And although it's now a race against time, the beauty of the valley we descend through isn't lost on us. It is a long and punishingly fast descent into camp. I am in agony. My back simply gave up and my head is swimming. I'm helped to my tent with the worst fears going through my mind. This really could be the end of my journey. If nothing changes by morning, the team will have to continue up without me. I'm